It's my turn to say good morning to you today. For those of you who don't know me, for those of you who may be visiting with us, I am not one of our pastors on staff. I am not Pastor Aaron, Pastor David, or Pastor Ed. I am one who is tagged in from the bench for the message today. I'm Ray Heskiff. Um, in official parlance here at the church, I am the chair of the Board of Deacons, but that's no never mind. That's not exactly why I was tagged for this. I was tagged for this because nobody else wanted to talk about self-control on the Sunday after Thanksgiving. No, just kidding. Um, actually, Paul Crow was initially supposed to be preaching today, but Paul has been a little bit under the weather and he's still got a little bit of, of issues with, you know, keeping his throat clear and the, and the lungs moving nice and freely, so I get to pinch hit. We're going to grab the last part of the fruit of the Spirit today. We've rolled through the other eight. It's number nine today, self-control. And I am sure that over the last few days, all of us have been very good about exercising this fruit, right? With the turkey and the potatoes and the stuffing and whatever else is on your family's regular menu. Not to mention, oh, if there are pies, yeah, pies. Before we start looking at what God's word has to say, will you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, I thank you for the privilege of having your word. And I pray that you would have us hear your word today. Lord, I know I am just a, a poor vessel to communicate what you have. But thank you for choosing to use me and for hiding me behind your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So Pastor Aaron has been bringing definitions all this series from Webster's Online Dictionary of 1828. So let's see what we can come up with for the definition of self-control. Surprise, Webster's 1828 Dictionary doesn't have an entry for self-control. But Webster's regular online dictionary does. Self-control, restraint exercised over one's impulses, emotions, or desires. Restraint. Just not letting things run wild. Not overindulging. Not just saying, hey, bring it on. Also online, I believe it was dictionary.com. Self-control. A little bit different. The power to control one's actions, impulses, or emotions. So Webster is looking at it as actually the action doing it. Dictionary.com is saying it's the ability to do that. There are some synonyms for self-control. Restraint. Self-discipline. Self-mastery. Willpower. All of these focus on our ability to do something. If this was about our ability to do something, then self-control would not be listed as a fruit of 
the Spirit. Yeah, we've got a bit of an ability that we can control some stuff if we really work at it, if we so choose. Let's all freely admit. Okay, I will freely admit. There are instances that I am not good at self-control. I probably shouldn't have had the pumpkin pie after the apple pie after the brownie last week. But pumpkin pie is my favorite. Some of those instances of self-control, we don't really want to have self-control, do we? God is not talking about in his word our ability to do things his way, to do what he wants, what he commands, what he expects. Because when it comes right down to it, we're not good at it. So let's take a look at what God's word has to say about self-control. And I'm, I didn't pick any particular order for these. I just said, let's just go in the order they show up, Genesis to Revelation. So here we go. The first one is Proverbs 25, 28. And this is the only reference to self-control that my concordance has. One. Old Testament reference. Here it is. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. Now, in our day and age, we know all about cities surrounded by walls, right? We've got that nice wall around Akron. No. You have to go back in history to understand the whole point of walls. If you didn't have walls, you didn't have control over the life of your city. If you didn't have walls, anybody could come moving in and do whatever they wanted. Walls were a way that you could control the life of your town, your village, your city. So if you didn't have walls, you had no control. Acts chapter 24, verse 25. Paul is talking with Felix. Felix is the governor of that area. Paul had recently been arrested in Jerusalem. He went to the temple was practicing his faith, the rulers of the temple and some of the other people, they didn't exactly like Paul. They didn't like that Paul taught about Jesus. Some people came in from the area where Paul had been doing his missionary work and they started to stir up some trouble. And so Paul was arrested. And Paul had been carried away from Jerusalem for his own protection but he was still under arrest. And Felix was the guy who was in charge of the area where Paul was being held. So here in Acts 24, verse 25, as Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. And he said, that's enough for now. You can leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you. You see, Felix liked to indulge in the niceties of his office. Felix didn't care too much about restraint. He certainly didn't want to hear the message that Paul was giving him. 
about self-control in particular and the judgment to come when Jesus Christ returns. So Felix sent him away. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. The next one in line. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Now Paul is talking to married couples in the church. And he's talking about a sexual relationship. Okay. Married couples are supposed to have sex. Paul is saying, don't deprive each other except by mutual consent and only for a time so that you can devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because you lack self-control. People don't have that problem, do they? Lacking self-control in physical aspects of relationships. If that were the case, you know, we're kind of on the tail end of this whole thing, of, you know, a Me Too movement, which was all dealing with problems in the expression of the sexual part of who people are, not wanting to hold it in the place where God has ordained it, the marriage relationship, a man and a woman. Our entire society seems to think nowadays that sex is the be all end all. That's not how it is. First Thessalonians chapter five, verses six through 11. <clears throat> Paul writes, so then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Paul drawing a distinction here. Awake and asleep. Alert and not. Self-controlled and not. A distinction between Who's in charge of the life? Who we are choosing to follow? If we are following Christ, we're not to be like those who are just kind of sleepwalking through life, letting things happen as they come. But to be alert and self-controlled. The whole point of this being alert and self-controlled is looking towards the salvation we have through Jesus Christ. It's not a passive salvation. Yes, Jesus did the work for us, but that's not where it's supposed to end. Once we accept the accomplished work of Jesus Christ, we have work to do, don't we? We're going to get a little bit more into some of the detail of that in just a couple of more verses here. But faith is not a passive thing. We are actors. We have action to accomplish. 
the whole point of being alert and self-controlled is a part and parcel of the salvation we have received through Jesus Christ. The focus is us being able to live forever with him, starting now. And at the end of the, these verses, part of that whole deal is we're to encourage one another. We're not walking this alone. We're not doing this acting as singular actors in the whole play that God is, is working out here. We're part of a body. We're part of a church. We're part of a greater Christian movement. And we are to encourage one another as we seek to strengthen our faith as we seek to express and live out what that salvation is. One another. Encourage one another. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, and here Paul uses the, the negative, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Have nothing to do with them. We don't see any of this around us today, do we? And Paul talking to Timothy, he, he had no idea about what was going on, right? We don't see that. With riots and looting and pick your headline story coming out of a major city without Jesus Christ where do we end up? In Titus, we've got a couple references now that we're going to look at in Titus. Paul left Titus on the island of Crete to add some organization and structure to the body of believers that Paul left there. And so we, Titus is setting up kind of the whole governing structure of the body of believers on Crete. And so in this book to Titus, Paul is giving him some guidance on how to do this. So Titus chapter 1 verse 8 Rather, he, he meaning the overseer, pastor, elder, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is, there it is again, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Now, in case you think that Paul was only worried about the people in the leadership positions there. Let's look at the other references coming up very quickly here in Titus. Titus chapter 2, just a few short verses away. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance.
A couple of verses later, chapter 2, verse 4, Paul is talking to older women, that they, the older women, can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure. Then in verse 6, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. So who is supposed to be self-controlled? Everybody. Everybody. Titus 2.12, for the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. A contrast here. The grace of God that brings salvation is what allows us to say no to ungodliness so that we can be self-controlled. If we don't have that grace from God, you know, go back to that verse in Timothy with that whole list of ugliness. Because left to our own devices, that's where we go. Paul's not the only one who writes about self-control or talks about self-control. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus is revealed. Okay, it starts with therefore. What's the point Peter is making here early in 1 Peter? He started out by talking about the prophetic teaching about Jesus' suffering and glory. How we have seen the suffering acted out and we'll see the glory. And in light of that work of Jesus, prepare your minds for action and be self-controlled. Setting our hope on what we can do, me. Setting our hope on Jesus Christ. The grace that we have received and the grace that will reveal him in all of his glory to us. In 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled. Why? So you can pray. Part of that whole idea of the self-control is to allow us to be focused on the things that are important. We tend to be very short-sighted, don't we? If it's not right here in front of our faces, you know, the old adage, out of sight, out of mind. The focus that we have is to be on Jesus Christ on the work we can accomplish through his spirit living with, within us. Part of the self-control is so we can pray, so we can be in that communication with our God, so we can understand what he is asking of us now, today. How we're supposed to respond to the situations in which we find ourselves. A little bit further in 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 8. Be self-controlled and alert. 
your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Self-controlled and alert. We've seen that combination a few times now. If we are lacking in that self-control, we make ourselves vulnerable. The self-control that we exhibit allows us to resist the temptation, to resist the devil seeking to destroy us because he wants to destroy the, the whole church, the whole mission of the people Jesus has left behind. Second Peter, chapter 1, starting with verse 5. For this reason, again, that's just kind of like therefore, Peter is leading into this, saying that we have been given everything necessary to live godly lives. We have been given through the, the work, the completed work of Jesus Christ, through his indwelling spirit, we have what is necessary for this reason, because you have what's necessary, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. I have run into so many people that just think an intellectual understanding of biblical teaching is all that's necessary for life. An intellectual assent that, yes, there is a God. And yes, Jesus Christ was indeed a, a man who lived a couple of thousand years ago and was crucified. And the evidence seems to point to a resurrection. And the New Testament gives us solid foundation for how to live a good life amongst one another. But knowledge isn't enough. If we stop with knowledge, we've got nothing. The knowledge has to lead us somewhere. And so Peter is talking about where that leads us. We add to our knowledge self control and perseverance and godliness. And so on. The goal is that we are not ineffective. That we are not unproductive. Meaning we are effective. Productive. That we can actually accomplish things. And in verse 9, if anybody does not have these increasing qualities. He's nearsighted and blind. I don't know about nearsighted. I'm my, I, I have a farsighted problem with my eyes, thus the glasses. And I'm weird in my family because the rest of my family is very nearsighted. Um, for years, we used to laugh. If you just wanted to hide from anybody in my family, take their glasses and just stand there because they won't be able to see you. If we don't have this increasing measure of all these things that Peter is talking about, we're as good as blind. And it's like we have forgotten 
what has transpired to bring us to the position we are. We have been cleansed. Make note of the tense of that phrase. An action that has been done to us. We didn't do it. We can't do it. We are cleansed by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ had not died on that cross, we would still be lost in our sin. He paid our penalty for us so that we could be cleansed. We can stand clean before the Lord because of what he has done, what he has accomplished. We didn't do it. Because of what he did, we can be effective witnesses, productive servants. See, the fruit of the Spirit is not something we can just create by our effort. Yes, there are lots of self-help things out there that give us tricks, that give us ways of training ourselves to be better or to get rid of old habits that we don't like, to create new habits that we want to have as a part of our lives. And yes, those are all well and good as far as they go. But they don't carry us to that perfection that we're called to. The fruit of the Spirit is in Galatians chapter 5, verse, starting in verse 22. But just a few verses before that, Paul is talking about the other side of the coin. Where we've come from. What else is out there. Galatians 5, starting in verse 16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. The Spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. There is a battle within us. What we want is very often contrary to what is best for us. In simple terms, that extra piece of pie was really good, but not what's best. When we look at the world around us and we desire some of the, the good things we see in that world, we desire our lives to be a certain way. We desire a certain comfort level. Do we ever ask the question, God, is that what you want for me? What we desire doesn't have to be overtly sinful to be contrary to what God has in store. A 
long time ago, um, the, there's this little phrase about good, better, and best, and about how good is the enemy of better, which is the enemy of best. And so often, we're very happy to settle for good. Because it takes more effort to get to better. And sometimes better is just so nice that we don't want to even consider best. What God has planned for us is best. Paul continues in Galatians 5, verse 19, drawing the distinction between where he's going and where we have been. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. And we can look at all those and say, seriously? No problem. Hatred. Discord. Jealousy. Fits of rage. Selfish ambition. Dissension. Faction. Envy. Any of those hit home? Drunkenness. Orgies. And the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So before he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, Paul started that whole section of the letter to the Galatians. This is where we go without the Spirit. This is life without God. Once you see Jesus Christ and what he has done for you, then comes the fruit. Romans chapter 13 verses 13 and 14. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. On our own, we can't do it. Clothe ourselves with Jesus Christ. Not our desires, his desires. James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 makes it pretty straightforward. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. Where does temptation come from? We make the target. We give Satan the ammunition. We all have areas in our lives that we're still holding on to things that shouldn't be there. And we're giving the opportunity For, for Satan to entice us, to tempt us, to draw us away, to make us ineffective in our witness. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, leads to death. In one sense... The whole idea of 
self-control, as we saw in the definition from Webster, is a myth, an illusion. We can try tricks and we can create habits, but ultimately, in order to have self-control, we have to reach beyond ourselves. Self-control is a bit of a misnomer. Um, there's a website, familylife.com, and uh, I was poking around on that website and found something called 10 Ideas Reflecting the Fruit of the Spirit. They flesh this out a little bit. When we follow the Spirit's lead, instead of being led by our own self-focused desires, He produces the fruit. But even when we don't walk by the Spirit, He is the very one who convicts us that things are not in proper order in our lives. Our fleshly desires, Scripture tells us, are continually at odds with God's spirit and always wanting to be in charge. Self-control is literally releasing our grip on the fleshly desires and choosing instead to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Think about that. In case you're wondering, I'm not so sure. Think about Genesis, Adam and Eve. In a perfect paradise, the Garden of Eden. Walking with God face to face in the garden. What do they do? There is one tree that they're supposed to leave alone. One tree whose fruit is off limits. What do they do? That's not the only example. We have David. King of Israel, a man after God's own heart. David on his balcony, looking out over the city, and he sees who? Bathsheba. And he does what? Sends out his servants to bring her back to the king's quarters. man after God's own heart. Let's go to the end of the book. We're in Revelation. We've got a thousand year reign of the Lamb of God on the throne. What happens at the end of that thousand years where we are in the presence of Jesus ruling. For the final time, Satan is loosed. And what happens? People flock to him. Even in paradise, we make bad choices. It's not our ability to have self control. Without the Spirit in us, we 
will fail. There's an organization that was founded in Akron, Ohio, that knows about this. They were founded. They may not push those founding principles as as intently today as they did. But they were founded on faith. And the recognition that God is the only one who can transform a life that has been destroyed. If you're familiar with AA and the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, Step one, we admit that we are powerless. For AA, it is we are powerless over alcohol. We are powerless over sin. We cannot handle it on our own. We admit we are powerless over sin and that our lives are unmanageable. For AA, they specify that sin that is dragging them down. They're alcoholics. They cannot control alcohol. It is controlling them. Think about your own life. Be honest with God. Be honest with yourself. Where are you struggling today? Step two. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. We can't do it on our own. Step three is where we yield. We made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. Since the beginning of AA, they've added a little phrase as we understood him. But we know who that God is, don't we? the God of the Bible. The God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. I am an imperfect being. I see my faults. Lord, I know where I come up short. I know where you need to be the one in charge and where I need to let go. Step five. In the church, we call this one confession. Admitted to God, to ourselves, And to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Ooh, we in the church don't like hearing something like that, do we? But remember back in 1 Thessalonians? Encourage one another. How can we encourage one another in our time of struggles if we don't know where those struggles are? If we don't know when we're hurting, how can we encourage? How can we support? How can we uphold and uplift 
if we don't know. And then the repentance. They don't call it that. But in steps six and seven, we entirely, we are entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. And we humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. AA still does that. They still abide by these 12 steps. What about us? Are we willing to make those kinds of statements to God, to one another. Part of me wonders if it might be a good idea to have a study of these 12 steps and how they apply to a Christian life. Because they do. They were written out of a Christian foundation. A recognition that there are some things we cannot do on our own. But God is able. God is willing if we just allow him. The last step, step 12, is having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others. They specify other alcoholics. We can specify other sinners, others living without surrender to Jesus Christ. And to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Self-control. It starts with recognizing, I don't have it. I need God to give that to me through his indwelling spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Where do you need the Spirit's help today? How can you encourage somebody that you know is struggling today? We're in this together. We need to lift one another up. We need to give our strength where our brother or sister is weak. And we need to accept their help where we struggle. Will you join me in doing that? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for giving us your son. Thank you for your love that meets us where we are, that recognizes that we can be a mess sometimes. Thank you that that love never gives up. Thank you that you have provided a way in all circumstances for us to lean on you 
to be upheld by your spirit. Lord, help us today and every day to turn those struggles over to you, to stop relying on ourselves, to stop thinking we've got it all covered, but to rely on you and you alone. this in Jesus' name.